Hi everyone, this is Juliana Avdieva here. Tonight I'm extremely excited to have a conversation with an amazing musician whose performances have been always a great source of inspiration for me, harpsichordist and conductor Trevor Pinock. Hello Trevor, it's such a pleasure to have you here. Hello, it's such a pleasure to be here and join you on your show. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, Trevor, I know that last week you have been to Rome uh, performing the Christmas Oratorio there with the Santa Cecilia Orchestra. Would you please tell me or share uh, your feelings about this performance under these special circumstances which we have right now and what was your feeling about it? What, what, how was it? Well, this would always be a performance that's very special. It's only occasionally I accept the invitations to work on a great Bach work or Handel work with the modern orchestra and modern choir in a huge concert hall. Um, I still love the way of the old instruments, but I also love the way of working with the modern. And so I'm a passionate believer that we should do this for all sorts of reasons. But today is not the time to discuss those reasons really, because as you said, it's a very special circumstance now. And so the conditions there were quite extraordinary, like nothing I've ever known in my life. One could say it's a sort of wartime performance. Um, I had wonderful musicians, I have to say an orchestra with whom I fell in love and they, I think, with me from the first moment that we started to make our music. A wonderfully willing choir, symphonic choir, of course, but cut down to small size. But they were placed behind a plexiglass oh. screen. Moreover, they were not in their normal formation, stacked up in nice risers. They had to stand on the ground level behind the orchestra in two long rows. These rows, there were 36 singers and they took the whole back area of the stage and all down the sides of the stage as well to give them in two rows. And of course the orchestra spread out. So in number we had what's, let's see, between 70 and 80 musicians on a stage made to take 250. And we filled that stage completely. And then of course we had in front of us a hall of 3000 people who were not there with a cavernous acoustic. And uh, so this made a set of conditions um, all the normal things that I would think about as the most important, um, the text, of course, of what we're doing, the text of the choir. Well, I couldn't hear the choir because they were behind the plexiglass. Um, so I don't know what text they were singing. I got a rough impression if they would be with me or getting behind. They, from their point of view, could not hear the orchestra who were in front of them, the other side of plexiglass screen. So this is a completely new set of conditions, of course. And what we had to do was um, basic survival at first. How would we breathe together and sing together? Uh, the building of a trust that if we all have a sense of the tact and the pulse of the music, that if we breathe together and set out on the journey, it will be a journey that we do together. So a tremendous faith in the power of our ability to do that. And then most important for me was that we remembered that we have a job to do and our job was to promote joy, the joy of this wonderful story of the infant birth. 
the which is always a miracle every time the birth of a child and so we had to remember this as a ground rule that we're there to promote this how to do this when we see nobody we don't have any sense that anybody's with us um i decided in the end when we came to our point of general proba or maybe i think at the point of general proba i asked everybody to sing to somebody they love very much to a close one so that we all had a a feeling of personal commitment together so this is it's, uh, largely we were setting things the weren't musical um uh we were doing things about basic housekeeping how to how to play together or sing together and having to let a lot of the detail of the music look after itself and this was our mission it was these because these were the conditions that we have there were no possibility of different conditions therefore we have to make it work through this and that was what do i say war time conditions and the power of music of course is huge and of bach's uh, the energy of bach's music wow there's no composer like bach who has the um his feet on the ground and his head in the heavens that he can bring the two together so closely that they're the same thing and i really think that in this piece everything that is human is also holy uh everything and we have to look after it it's a great lesson to us it's very wonderful that in the christmas oratorio bach wrote quite a lot of the music as secular music before he put it in the form of the christmas oratorio with religious words and this worried a lot of people a lot of commentators and musicologists of deep faith because they felt it couldn't be right that it was secular and then the religious words came later surely they felt bach had the religious words in mind and then put the secular words um i think this misses the point uh i think for bach to be human is to accept everything of humanity and everything then becomes holy and it's not in these little compartments so that's really what we were concentrating on in performing christmas oratorio in this wonderful concert hall in rome with wonderful musicians and and the soloists of course came and made the most beautiful contribution uh there we were on our own no audience but feeling very much that this music does and can and must connect with people so well, there we are i told you about it that's such a such a wonderful experience uh which you wish you are sharing um i had a i personally had a feeling um now playing with orchestras with this physical distance when people when we all sit so far away from each other that on one hand uh, the musicians also get more sensitive because we cannot rely on what we what we're really hearing so it it yeah. somehow it brings us closer together in a way but that that how i felt um about the experiences i had this uh, autumn playing with orchestra because yeah. the the piano is most of the time very far away from the orchestra and the orchestra musicians sit sit again with a big distance between each other so somehow it sharpens the feel, the other senses the other feelings which i really very very much enjoyed because it's a, it, it, it's a very different type of experience but that's also what how i felt about this although of course it's very yeah. unusual just i'm glad you say this because 
I think we don't use a lot of the powers that we actually have. We don't use the senses. And so uh, people feel that they must be able to see, for instance. They must be able to see the moment that another player plays a note so, th so that they can play together. It's not true. Normally, the playing together is done better if, if they would shut their eyes and just play. And, uh, and so we have such um, developed senses which we don't use, or perhaps we don't develop enough. And I think it's very true that in this situation, we're being called upon to develop those senses. And this is one of the valuable things, isn't it, of the of this situation. One thing I've also noticed with very busy orchestras, I've only done a couple of concerts, so I can, not much, you know, uh, but uh, orchestras who would have um, a feeling of going to work every day um, are so grateful to be playing music that it's refreshed them People who've been in the business many years come to it again with the freshness of a child excited to make music, you know, with the freshness that made them come to the profession in the first place. Yes, absolutely. And um, <clears throat> um, it's just it's just very, for me, also during this time, it is basically very... Um, I spent many thoughts about the, also about the role of the art in our lives. What, what, what is it for us? What is it for our society? But also what I'm very, I didn't find the right answer yet, but what would you say for you is the role also of the, of the art itself? For them also for being a musician, what it is for you, how do you see it for the society, but also how would you describe or what could, can the artists themselves also do now in this uh, very unusual uh, situation which we have now? It's a big question, isn't it? Um, <laughs> I think the first thing is, is perhaps that we have to know how important a part, a, a, a part of our whole being, this art that we are gifted with is. Uh, as a performing musician or as a creative artist, um, it's not just something we do, it's something that affects our whole being. And two of the singers I've just worked with, the solo singers, expressed this very eloquently to them, to me. Um, one who recently had a, a baby a, um, with enormous complications and risk of dying and, and, and uh, terrible things. Um, of course, a, a traumatic period, but then after all those months of trauma, He's now singing again and finding music and it's so much part of his being. And then another singer, wonderful singer, who came to me and said how painful it had been not being able to sing and perform in the normal way because somehow our whole bodies and our whole psyche needs this. So that's one question of our need um, for our art, because it's, um, it's a food to us that we, uh, and if we're deprived of it, we're somehow less as people. Perhaps it, that's a lesson to us because perhaps we, it might make us grow into another area. Um, you know, if it feels that we're less, we might be able to expand in some other area. I don't know, really. Um, but the meaning for art 
um, and our music to the listeners. Of course, it's varied experience, but I know over many years how many people um, really rely on what music can give them. Uh, it, you know, music and the other arts too, but especially as a musician, I have to say music, um, it opens a door to somewhere which is not the everyday, of course, uh, as you know so well. But, uh, and I think at a time when there's a general confusion about religion and spirituality and what it is, and, and there's so many paths available, um, music becomes more and more important as a resource for helping people step away from just the mundane and expand to give it the foundation of, of what life is surely really about and what all the religions are trying to teach with their different words. I think um, Bach has a great advantage that he does it with music and we feel the stability um, and total understanding of this man, what he does for us. And it, it's without the complications of words, which everybody puts a different interpretation on words. And you could say, oh, well, everybody puts a different musical interpretation on Bach. Um, that's true, but the fact is that it's happened over the centuries and the interpretations sort of pass by and they're fashionable or not fashionable, but Bach always remains untouched by our uh, interpretations. They're just a moment of fashion and uh, they're an honest response or a dishonest response at the m moment. But the fact is that the music stays absolutely solid. And it, this music has taken us through uh, pandemics and wars over centuries, and it will go on doing so. I find that tremendous. Yeah, absolutely. So in a way, I think the music is a, it's a kind of universal language, which um, also allows everyone to discover new worlds, new places, and also to, I think, even to travel, literally to travel. And also, the, the I, I'm always so fascinated by the fact that Bach never traveled a lot. He, he was not traveling around, but never, still, nevertheless, he he was so familiar with the Italian style, uh, with, with, every, with French, of course. So he was, he knew everything about every, uh, style around around him without really leaving his, uh, let's say, small place, right? I mean, yeah. and yeah. I think that this also shows this, um, yes, this ability of music indeed to, through the musical language to indeed to show other places without physically really being being there. And uh, I think this is so, so fascinating also, also in, in Bach's music, again, that's again, a, it's, I find it a proof that it's not sometimes necessary to travel physically somewhere. It's, it's all here in the imagination, in the soul. Yes. yes. Of course, it's interesting that the first book of the Voltemperia to Clavier is absolutely teaching pieces. That was its specific purpose. Uh, it's not made for concert performance, um, but it is absolutely made for teaching his children and his pupils. The second book's a little bit different. I think I have the feeling that he it was something he wanted to do from a composition point of view and he was doing it, quite a lot of it, for himself and experimenting. Uh, he was using some very up-to-date sort of 
uh, elements in composition going into a gallant style, which wasn't his normal style. But the wonderful thing is that he took this gallant style, which was in other people's hands rather simple, and he made it, of course, very complex, and generally used that style for the most difficult keys, the ones with which are almost completely sharps, and that, and which is something that they didn't really go with the style in the hands of other composers. It's quite interesting. Telemann, who lived to a great age, he also did something similar with a, there's a cantata called Ino, and he was using um, very late composition style. And I know what these older guys were doing. They were um, very pleased to just be able to show younger people how, to, if you want to do it like that, I'll show you how to do it properly. <laughs> And especially with Bach, I, I think, and, and you won't even begin to understand what I'm doing. Well, I think Bach apparently had a very, a really great sense of humor, which yeah. somehow it also, I think in, in his music, it is also very audible that he was a, he had a very sharp mind and yeah. <laughs> uh, that's, um, also, for me, a very special, um, let's say, special uh, quality. Sorry, <laughs> quality of um, also of of his music. But um, you have recorded this year, two thousand twenty, the first book of uh, Well Tempered Clavier, which is for me it was absolutely it's such a fantastic uh, recording, which I heard so many times in this this year also. Um, it was a great inspiration uh, for me, uh, you know, also uh, working on the book one for myself. I mm -hmm. was, oh, I'm of course very, <sighs> for, for me, just listening to your sound, to you, I, I found your, uh, the, the, the sound, the tone of your um, instrument, which you have used for this recording, that was extremely, it was very warm sound with a, with a, with a great, with a, I would say that, that it, for me, each sound had a kind of special color, and this and it had uh, the space to, uh, to 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 develop. And the, the, the I, I, there was absolutely um, fantastic. So, could you please maybe tell me a little bit about this particular piano and about the tuning system? I know a little bit about your. Uh, idea about the uh, tuning system for uh, the well-tempered clavier, but maybe you could um, I'll do my it. best. Yeah. Um, first, let's think about the instrument. I fell in love with this instrument when I first saw it in 1982, a very long time ago. And, uh, and I borrowed it because it had just been made for somebody else, and I borrowed it for some concerts in New York. And then it went to the owner. But um, later, uh, just a year or so later, the owner decided that um, he and she would take a, a different instrument in place of it so that they could give it to me, which was very nice. And so it came to, they came to me this because I really fell in love with it um, in the way that you fall in love with a person. I was absolutely, totally in love. You know, I, when I first met it, I played it all night long, completely. I was totally alone in a warehouse with this instrument. And anyway, so there's my love affair with the instrument. And of course, we know each other very well. We've lived together for a long time. And so the sound is both the sound of the instrument, but it's also the, my sound. It comes from inside me. And, uh, and uh, that's something you'd understand as a musician, uh, how it's, for any musician, they have their sound. And, and that 
some instruments will respond to that in one way, in a very, very good way, and others won't, and you have to just uh, talk with them and fi find, a, find an arrangement. So that's the one thing. Of course, I had a very good recording engineer and a very good acoustic to help this quality as well. And then the tuning system, that's quite simple. Uh, you know, we, normally now we tune uh, in an equal temperament where every key sounds quite the same. This was unusual in Bach's time. And normally the tuning temperaments prior to Bach had been quite extreme so that some keys sounded really beautiful uh, on a harpsichord, say, or on an organ, and other keys sounded absolutely terrible. Um, Bach himself and other people around him at the time were beginning to want to explore these more extreme keys. And so there was coming a move towards a more equal type of temperament. But there was still, I believe, the feeling that keys would have a slightly different quality. Uh, and, and so some would have um, major thirds, which were smoother and very pleasing. And other ones would have a bit of tension to them. There would be a strong difference between a C major and F sharp major, say. Yeah. Uh, but of course, writing in all the keys, then we know we're getting somewhere close to some sort of equal temperament. And we have to find a, a, a system which uh, is, really does temper the, all the keys in some sort of way, but still get a bit of color in it, I believe. Uh, and so I discussed that I have a wonderful tuner who, of course, I do tune myself, but I have a wonderful tuner who was really scrupulous in working on this with me. And I think it's worth it. May I ask you if you have also your own tuning system? Well, this, uh, what we used on the Bach was really my own tuning system that I came. Um, there's a lot of theoretical tuning systems of the 18th century, yes. um, even equal temperament, and then all sorts of others. Um, from what I can feel and from something Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach said about his father's tuning, I have the impression that he did it as rather as I do as a musician, which is not to do it uh, with all the exact um, equations of all the beats from a scientific point of view, but to do it from ear, which comes to a similar but different uh, mm -hmm. result in somehow. And uh, so it's, it's the very personal thing, the tuning. And I, I don't think there's just one answer to uh, how one should tune for Bach. Uh, different musicians would find different answers, I think. And so uh, this sort of tuning thing, it's, it's very important on the harpsichord to create the color. On the piano, um, which has different elements, is not so important. You have elements, of course, of, of much more um, dynamic possibility than I do on the harpsichord. Uh, on the harpsichord, we sort of suggest dynamics or imagine dynamics uh, and give color in a, in a different way. Sometimes we can influence it with the articulation. We can give some sort of impression. All these things very slight that we do actually hear the music rather than come away thinking, Oh, what marvelous articulation, or that sort of thing. Then, if anybody would say that, we know immediately it's too much. Yes, you know, I'm 
uh, why I'm asking about this tuning system, because um, as I studied in being a student in Zurich at the uh, Hochschule der Künste in, in Zurich, I had a great luck to have lessons with um, Professor Johann Sonnleitner on, on the harpsichord, who also, that was my first experience uh, of different tuning systems, because being a, a trained pianist, I was not, by the, but until then I did not know how it sounds. And I had a chance also by myself to, to try out different, uh, diff different uh, tuning systems. And I was really astonished by the, by the difference also in, in the color when, when, when you, but of course yeah. it's a great limitation at the same time, because then you can use the, for instance, D major sounds uh, really very amazing very, with a great, uh, it's a very joyful, it's a very wonderful, yes. And then, uh, but you at the same time you cannot you, you cannot really use let's say uh, A flat major or something like this. So it means that you have to uh, also, yeah, you have to concentrate on the pieces only uh, in D major on so, or some other tonalities where, where, which are yes. suitable with this uh, tuning system. And that was for, for me really. Uh, absolutely new type of it also to really to hear with the ears that this difference in, in the tuning how, how, how what an impact it makes on the uh, emotion of the of, of, of the of the tonality that was absolutely amazing but uh, so of course it I, I thought it's a great actually of course it's a great it's a very strong size that uh, side that it's possible to um, prepare special keys or special works in special keys to give them this special character. And on the other hand, it's a little bit difficult because then you, ha you are really have to concentrate yourself only on the, this very little amount of keys, yes. which is, of course, from what I, what I understand that the wall temper clavier first was not, Bach didn't, probably didn't even think ever thought that someone will play them as a cycle. Exactly. And so, uh, and you could argue that uh, from a harpsichord point of view, that you should simply tune according to the keys and do random tunings throughout. Um, but I think, on the other hand, uh, if you are crazy enough to play all the pieces next to each other, then it's interesting to yes. uh, make this tuning that we'll be able to do all. Of course, uh, the interesting thing is that quite a number of those pieces Bach transposed from yes. other key. So uh, we, at least from that, we know the answer that he didn't have a fixed idea that a certain piece of music should have a certain color in such and yes. such a key. We know at least that. There's various things that we know. The, the other thing is that it always used to be said that the uh, Voltemperi at the clavier was probably composed for the clavichord. Right. Um, and, but the fact is that the clavichord of Bach's time of the first book, um, they only had this small clavichord which used one string to play different notes. And, uh, and you simply can't play quite a number of the pieces on that clavichord yes. because it doesn't make sense. Some of the pieces you can, of course, and they would sound very beautiful. Um, by the time of the second book, there were fully chromatic clavichords being, being um, built with one, uh, with strings for every note. Uh, so that's interesting. And Bach's harpsichord was very simple too. It, it had a compass of uh, the low C until the high C, mm -hmm. not, not more. What, how would you describe the difference also in the, in the musical language between the book one and book two? How, what, what do you feel is really different in, in these two? Uh, books. Uh, the main thing I find is is Bach's increased interest in later sort of composition techniques, and of and two of a more extreme 
freedom in using what he always loved, which was chromaticism. Right. Uh, because he was really quite obsessed with chromaticism. Um, and I think we learn that too when we look at some of his much more personal pieces, like the chromatic fantasy and fugue, which here we get an insight into how Bach might himself improvise and how his mind was working. And then another very interesting to piece to look at is the first written cadenza of the Fifth Brandenburg Concerto, a very short but incredibly chromatic and totally crazy uh, um, piece of music, which you would associate more with um, probably with uh, Wilhelm Friedemann, who was, uh, I think, quite crazy, um, um, or certainly so in the music. Um, and um, But when Bach made the more formal presentation book of the Brandenburg Concertos, he replaced it with this big cadenza that we all know and love. Of course, there was perhaps another reason for that too, because uh, he was, they were just, he was taking delivery of a new and wonderful harpsichord that had been built, and no doubt he wanted to sew it off. And one thing I find very appealing is that Bach, this greatest composer of all composers, was quite willing to totally destroy the architecture of the first movement of the Fifth Brandenburg Concerto by writing this huge concerto for a player um, himself totally unbalancing it and it's very nice to see this i've found that seeing these sort of elements of bach helped me dare to approach his music because sometimes one feels with him so great that one hardly has the right to touch the music and so to have some glimpses of him as a playing a musician uh, helped me a lot. I enjoyed so much uh, when you were talking, and I was reading in some some thoughts of you on the book one, uh, where you were saying that, uh, of course, Bach. Well, that's how I I I don't quote, but that's how I understood your word, words. That uh, this, of course, that Bach's music is very intellectual and it's coming from from the from the intellect, but. Um, you were also mentioning the G major prelude and, uh, and fugue from book one that the that the, uh, the the musicians who perform Bach should still never or pianist should never forget what kind of player he or the kind of uh, tremendous virtuoso he was and what kind of abilities he had on the instrument. I and I, I, I I'm always <laughs> thinking about this. Um, uh, this fact that apparently Bach uh, also could um, make an improvisation in, 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 far, in five parts. So he, there is a story that once he arrived somewhere, I think with uh, uh, William Friedemann and um, uh, somebody gave him a subject and Bach was able to make an improvisation on this subject in, in five parts, just, uh, just out of nothing. And of course, this I think that's really for, for me it was so also inspiring, really to just this thought that one should never forget this spirit of Bach, this this really also very playful, very energetic spirit, also coming from his uh, performer skills. Let's yeah. say yes, it's interesting to think in these days. Uh, where we we try to be very dedicated musicians and only musicians doing what we do. It's good to remember that uh, certainly in his Leipzig period, Bach was, his main job was as a schoolmaster, not as a musician. Yes. And he had to teach Latin and other subjects and keep the boys in order. Um, and I think it's sometimes worth us reflecting on that, uh, especially at a time, perhaps now this COVID time, where um, 
we have to change our views about what we're doing. And I thought from the beginning of the first thing that there's only two possibilities that we have with this terrible thing, uh, which is that we become victims of it or that we become pioneers of a new way of moving forward. Uh, because I felt then, and I still feel, that uh, life has changed in a very big way. And will uh, people kept talking about uh, going back to normal at first. And then they talked about going back to a new normal. So people are talking less about these things now. Um, and perhaps everybody's coming to the realization that we We've got to create something different. Uh, who knows what our world economy will be um, as we move forward in the next years. Uh, every country has had to deal at such cost with this. And the future implications are not clear. Uh, and and the whole business of how we work, it's not clear. Everything's uncertain. Um, but we, through all of this, we have to go on believing in our music and, and knowing that that will find a way through. And so it's, it's helpful then to come back to Bach as the school teacher and see uh, how he managed. Yes, um, of course, I, I, I think, well, for me personally, music is probably only, well, making music is probably the only, the only thing in these months which feels like stable, you know, that this is still the, 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 mm, the place or the moment when I, I can calm down, when I really, literally, uh, when the, the life and the body, the, the soul, it feels some kind of harmony, which is, of course, through the uh, through the just uncertain times, it's all a little bit disbalanced. Well, I, that's how I, I feel in a way. And the music is this other perspective, gives another perspective. It gives also in the moment of big, uh, well, when I'm nervous or something, it's still this, this, this constant um, support, which, which is always helpful. Well, that's how I also feel about this. Can you please tell me also about the book too? So now you are working on the recording of the book too. Is that right? What could I tell you? I um, It's hard for me to say things about it in words, you know, uh, because I'm not, a, I'd never been a scholar. I never went to university or anything like that. So I never learned the things that people are, learn, those things. Um, but um, what I've had to learn from the book too is uh, more and more about uh, architecture and structure of the music and trying to understand, take it apart very slowly and understand what's, what Bach is doing with all his subjects and counter subjects and the delight that he ha has in tricking the ear by suggesting that there will be a subject, but actually there's not this time. And then he sneaks the subject in uh, almost imperceptibly. And this is where, where uh, I think some pianists are wrong because they feel they have to bring out every subject in an extraordinary way, but actually, uh, sometimes the whole point of it seems to me that it can hardly be heard, but there it is. Of course, there is, I mean, uh, there's something which we try to do on the harpsichord, I would certainly try to do, is to, um, to reveal that the subject is there, but it can't be done by uh, putting it onto a trombone, you know, it... it it's done within the texture, and it's it's done by a, a special sort of mental process. And so 
uh, an advanced listener or somebody who understands your music making will certainly come with you onto that part and appreciate it that it's there. Others may miss it. Um, so that's a very, and I felt this more and more as I'm playing the book too. Now, whether that's because it is elements of book two, or whether it's simply that with all the work I did on book one and all the work I've done on music in my life, whether I simply have come to appreciate something more and am finding it more in book two, I, I couldn't tell you the answer to that. Um, my feeling about how we should make music is generally that um, our job as musicians is to ask the music to tell us what it wants, rather than to decide what we want to do with it. Uh, and so to sit quietly with it and, and keep playing it and till it will reveal itself, rather than, as sometimes I, I find um, with younger players that they feel very much a pressure to stamp their personality on the music or to make musical decisions about this or that. Um, I think one of the things is the pressure of all the recordings that have been made because people feel they have to probably do something different to whatever somebody has done before. Uh, this is a very different way. When I studied a long time ago in the 1960s, it was still a time when um, I don't think that there was that obsession. Uh, if you, um, you know, if you could do it like Wilhelm Kempf did it, uh, then that would you would have reached the sort of highest point, and and right. um, and why would you question that? Uh, and in general, there was, I think, a little bit more idea that um, to play the notes more or less in time was already a good thing to do uh, before certainly to do that before taking the decision that the notes shouldn't be in time uh, so uh, attitudes have changed yes and some of this new flexibility that's offered um, has value but i think the discipline of the thinking process and the fact that the music is always more important than the actual performer is still important. Uh, absolutely, yeah. in, in a way, uh, it is the, still I think that the performer, even if it feels like we're co-creating the works, we are performing, but still we're serving the composer we're serving the music we perform but that's what i think what we do yeah for bach he would have considered it quite unnatural that a performer simply performs I, the idea of writing the first book of the voltemperiata clavier was not only to teach performance but to teach the art of composition right and so that would be expected that everybody would do that. So already we're in a strange age. Um, I say this as, as somebody who doesn't compose and can't compose. So I, I feel um, that I'm lacking that element and I simply have to do what I can do and uh, try and do it better because of that. I just wanted to ask you whether you improvise uh, so, sometimes? Well, of course, if I'm playing a continuo of uh, yes. accompanying somebody, that is always done in an improvisatory yeah. way. And I like the freedom of that. That's a very special art. And it's uh, something that's worth practicing a lot because 
to try to get a really nice leading of the voices uh, so the lines make sense and the harmony is supporting whatever it has to, but also it, not sort of chopping around. And it, it's quite a difficult thing, I think. What do you think Bach, do you think that Bach ever expected uh, the development also of the uh, harpsichord uh, or uh, clavichord also to the kind of modern piano? What do you think uh, are maybe the strong sides of performing Bach's music on a modern piano and what are the weaknesses of this? I don't think he would have ever thought about that strongly, but um, of course he was very interested in developments of instruments and he did see um, a rudimentary early piano, uh, um, nothing like our modern piano and nothing like the piano that even Mozart had. And he was very interested in this. And so he was definitely somebody with an open mind. I think what would have amazed him more is the whole idea of concerts and what they are and these huge audiences and, and uh, I think it would have been very far outside his conception of what music is. Uh, it's impossible for us to understand the mind of Bach or perhaps of anybody of that age because the relationship between God and man was so totally different then, before the age of enlightenment, when we started feeling that we as, as humans have some um, input on our destiny. And for Bach, you know, living life, you lived life and you did your best in order to earn the right to go to a better place. Yes. And this was important. And it's so, we don't really understand this way of thinking today. In the, you see, there wasn't, for anybody who lived at that time, there was one path of religion. You were either Christian in the way that you did it, Protestant or Catholic, wherever you lived. You were Christian or you went to hell. There was no other possibility. Um, and there weren't all those different spiritual paths that you could go and get at the local supermarket, you know, of spiritual beliefs. Um, it's, it's a very, very different way of thinking. But still, his music, for me personally, it's. I absolutely agree that the people, that yeah, they were think, thinking differently, and of course, living also differently. But still, his music is. Uh, it is exactly the same. Really, it could have been composed today, also in its, um, in its clarity, in its message, musical and hum human message. That's. Well, of course, they were. The uh, there is the common ground that they were also humans, just like we are. But the the whole mental process of thinking through, of course, very different. Um, but in the, of course, music breaks bounds, which is why it has the ability to worry some people greatly, because you can't really control it and you can't control the thoughts in music. Uh, I used to feel this very strongly when I went to the East to perform in the days before the wall came down. And uh, the audiences were so thirsty and needy for the music. And you were aware, it, it was getting close to the time where things would change. And I was aware at that time that it, it was a very subversive and secret sort of shared experience because 
this music, this ancient music. Of course, that was already subversive because it was on old instruments and it, it was expressing uh, a, a sort of new hope in the way that music can and a shared experience in the way that music can and has done throughout the ages. I think that's the wonder of it. Absolutely. Trevor, I thank you so much for this wonderful conversation, for me, for so, such an inspiring um, conversation. So my question uh, would be, what kind of feeling will remain for you for the year as a symbol for the year 2020? What, what, what would it be or what will it be? Oh, I always have hope. I've always had hope. Sometimes in life things have been very difficult, but I'd never lose hope because, um, well, of course, in music, you have something, you have a precious jewel inside, and this feeds us wonderfully all the time. And this is all sorts of music too. I'm just right now, recently, I've been listening to the favorite music of my four-year-old grandson, who loves all music. He loves Bach, he loves Mozart, everything. But he's greatly now and introduced me to the wonderful music making of Beyonce and Ariana Grande. Ariana Grande, who has a fabulous voice. And somebody called Jesse J and Nicki Minaj. Oh, these are, these are um, special and they're such good musicians and good performers. And we should always go outside our own things and appreciate just what the power is of music for people and not just our Bach that we love, uh, but all, all sorts of music. Absolutely. So Trevor, I thank you so much for this wonderful conversation and I wish you good health and um, great inspiration also in uh, the year 2021. And I'm so much looking forward to the recording of the book two of Well-Tempered Clavier. By oh, thank you. Yes, I've recorded three quarters of it, but the next time I'm able to get into the particular recording hall is next summer and that's when I'll finish it. So I have eight eight preludes and fugues to go. I can't wait and uh, oh. thank you so much uh, one more time and I wish you a peaceful Christmas time and a very happy new year. I wish absolutely the same to you. It's been fun talking Thanks with you much. and I wish you lots of courage and good things to face the new year and we'll go forward armed with our music. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much.